So this is our second video for banking and financial institutions. The topic is Central Bank of the Philippines. The subtopics that we will be discussing, the development of central banking, brief history of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, objective of BSP, and the functions of central bank. Okay, so the first part of the discussion is the development of central banking. So basically, this is the history. And I would admit that I'm not that very good with history. <laughs> okay. So um, I have here a an article from CleaplandFed.org. So basically, the development of central banking. Uh, this 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 did not originate from the Philippines. Um, so this article is mostly the development of central banking uh, in the U.S. Okay, and then how it evolved from there and how other countries. Uh, started their own uh, central banks okay so I'm just gonna read this to you and then uh, if I have something to share then I will add them okay so let's go at it a central bank is the term used to describe the authority responsible for policies that affect a country's supply of money and credit so more specifically a central bank uses its tools of monetary policy, open market operations, discount window lending, changes in reserve requirements to affect short-term interest rates and monetary-based currency held by the public class, the bank reserves, and to achieve important policy goals. Okay. So basically, central banks, they have this uh, responsibility to ensure that uh, every year, the BSP actually, what do you call this, estimate or project the level of inflation that the economy is going to have. And as much as possible, they're trying to control uh, the rate of inflation okay? because inflation is bad. Okay? Uh, rising prices is what it means. Okay? So what they do is that they monitor, they control the amount of money that's circulating in the economy. Okay? And if there's too much uh, money supply in the economy, what they do is that they take a portion, or not really take a portion, they, they <laughs> remove a portion of the money supply and then put it in their reserves in the BSP, okay? So there's what they're trying to do is they're trying to balance the amount of money that's in circulation based on the needs of the economy, okay? And then in cases where in the economy, uh, in the economy or in the market, there's less uh, supply of money. Okay, so what the BSP do is that through uh, government spending or through government projects or through release of business loans or loans to individuals, they infuse money into the economy, into the market. So in a way. Uh, they do try to control the amount of money that's in circulation based on the needs of the economy so that they could also uh, monitor or control the inflation rate. And of course, uh, another thing that they do is they also control the interest rates. Okay? Uh, adjusting the interest rates, uh, they can lower it or they can increase it depending again on the amount of money that's in circulation. Okay? If there's no demand for cash, okay, uh, less people are borrowing money from financial institutions, what the BSP do or does is they lower the interest rate. So since the interest rate is low, if you borrow money from the bank, you're, you'll be paying less interest. Okay? So they're, ma they're trying to make it more attractive so that people would be encouraged to borrow money from the banks. Okay? In that case, uh, in a case where in the people are not spending money because they don't have the money and they are not uh, keen to borrow money from financial institutions, so that's one of the things that the BSP can do. They can lower the interest rate. Okay, and then in case naman uh, the public is spending too much, okay, spending too much, of course, that would contribute to the inflation. Okay, and so what the PSP do is that they would like to 
try and discourage borrowing from financial institutions. Less borrowing uh, from financial institution would mean that there would be less money in circulation. Okay, and less money in circulation, the inflation rate would be controlled or toned down. Okay, so what they would do then would be to increase interest rates so that they could, you know, discourage borrowers from getting money. And then if they don't get the money, then they would have less to spend. Okay, so basically that's how the monetary policy works. But we'll be discussing that in our next subject, FM 104. Okay, my cat is annoying again. Okay, continuing on, one of the world's foremost economic historians explains the forces behind the development of modern central banks providing insight into their role in the financial system and the economy. So there are three key goals of mod modern monetary policy. The first and most important is price stability or stability in the value of money. Okay? That's why they're trying to control the inflation rate. As much as possible, they don't want the prices of goods and services to go up because, again, one of their key goals is price stability. Okay? Today, this means maintaining a sustained low rate of inflation. The second goal is a stable real economy often interpreted as high employment and high and sustainable economic growth okay high employment why uh, more people are employed so they would be you know getting salaries and then when they get their salaries they would be spending them and when they spend that money when they buy products and services that contributes to the reported gdp of the country and gdp is uh, a measure of the economic activity of a country okay um i'm not sure if you've already had your economics class but i'm going to assume that you did or that you already have it okay so that's uh the second high employment and then high and sustainable economic growth so since they're going to sustain the level of high employment so uh what you're going to assume is that at that level of high employment so they're the country is going to get a certain level of you know gdp and then in that sense the economic growth would also be sustained today so it's important that when people have money they have to spend it so that uh, that would contribute in the circulation of money and in the production of goods and services so economic activity as a whole so another way to put it is to say that monetary policy is expected to smooth the business cycle and to set shocks to the economy. So kumbaga, uh, keep the businesses going and operating. Okay? The third goal is financial stability. This encompasses an efficient and smoothly running payment system and the prevention of financial crisis. So financial stability, uh, what they're pointing here is a payment system. So it makes it makes it easy for the people to spend their money okay and then of course prevention of financial crisis make sure that uh, the people are uh, putting their money in the right places and that there is a little chance of financial fraud okay for those kind of things say hello to the cat it's becoming annoying again all right beginnings the story of central banking goes back at least to the 7th century. The, the founding of the first institution, institution recognized as a central bank, the Swedish, was this, Riksbank, established in 1668. Wow, that's so far back. As a joint stock bank, it was chartered to lend the government funds and to act as a clearinghouse for commerce. But that's basically what the central banks are doing nowadays uh, they do lend to the government but essentially they're also under the rule of the government part they're part of the government a few decades later uh, 1694 the most famous central bank of the era the Bank of England was founded also as a joint uh, stock, stock company to purchase government debt uh, bonds treasure bills other central banks were set up later in Europe for similar purposes, though some were established to deal with monetary uh, disarray. Okay. 
So basically, yeah, supervision then, uh, monitor, monitoring. For example, the bank, what's this? Banque de France was established by Napoleon in 1800 to stabilize the currency after the hyperinflation of paper money during the French Revolution, as well as to aid in government finance. Early central banks issued private notes which served as currency and they often had a monopoly over such note issue, okay? which still is currently happening each country produces their own money or prints their own money which is, you know, being used in circulation. While these early central banks helped fund the government's debt, they were also private entities that engaged in banking activities. Because they held the deposits of other banks, they came to serve as banks for bankers, facilitating transactions between banks or providing other banking services. Okay, so here's the deal with the BSP. So BSP is basically, you know, Banco Central and Filipinas, the bank of banks okay you have all these banks being regulated and monitored by bsp and of course these banks would receive money from their depositors and then most of this money are being lent out to borrowers okay but still they would definitely have a large a large amount of money in their in their hands okay but this money are not maintained in their own vaults uh, these are deposited to BSP and in the BSP they have this uh, I'm not sure how I uh, is it a warehouse it's a vault or a facility where they keep a majority of you know the banknotes uh, the Philippine money okay so if uh, basically there's a capital retention requirement so let's say uh, a bank has one let's say one billion in deposits 10 percent of it must be maintained in the form of cash so if it's 10 percent of one billion so that's like a hundred million okay so the hundred million this would not be uh kept in banks or in bank uh bank branches so majority of these uh, would be sent to BSP okay, to be kept in their uh, facility okay and then the rest of the money would of course be used in the operations of the banks 90% of the capital or the deposits would be lent out to the borrowers okay so that's one uh, role being played by the central banks uh, they became the repository for most banks in the banking system because of their large reserves and extensive networks of correspondent banks. And I think in a way they also act as a lender for other banks. So let's say you have these banks with excess and then you have this bank that's needing some sort of money or some additional capital. Uh, so the Bank of Central and Filipinas would be able to uh, lend money to these banks that are in need, okay? Because they do have the some sort of deposits in them. They are the bank of banks, okay? <clears throat> these factors allow them to become the lender of last resort in the face of the financial crisis. In other words, they became willing to provide emergency cash to their correspondents in times of financial distress. Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, even uh, to this day, uh, BSP is also uh, the lender of last resort. So let's say there's a bank and it's having financial difficulties. It's, uh, what do you call this? It's about to get bankrupt. So the BSP would have to evaluate their situation. Are they, what do you call this, salvageable? <laughs> Uh, is there a chance to revive the operations of the bank? Okay, if there's a chance, then the BSP would be willing to lend them the capital or to lend them the money so that they can they can continue their operations and that they could revive their operations so that they could survive uh, the crisis that they are going through, the problems that they are going through. Okay, uh, why is it important for uh, the BSP to help out these uh, struggling banks? Uh, because these banks basically they provide employment okay, to the community and also they are holder 
of uh, the money of the depo of the depositors okay so they have been entrusted with the money of the general public and the PSP would like to ensure that the people the depositors who put their money in that bank would uh, have a chance to still get their money okay they don't want the money to suddenly disappear when they go bankrupt okay so the BSP acts as the lender of last resort they would like to help out the struggling banks okay to ensure that uh, there would be less damage okay because if that bank uh, closes so many people would be affected not only the employment but as well as you know the depositors who trusted them with their money that's going to be in a way undermining the financial industry the financial system okay so that's another role being played by the central bank a transition the federal reserve system belongs to a later wave of central banks which emerged at the turn of the 20th century these banks were created primarily to consolidate the various instruments that people were using for currency and to provide financial stability okay so many also were created to manage the gold standard to which most countries adhered the gold standard which prevailed until 1914 meant that each country defined its currency in terms of a fixed weight of gold central banks held large gold reserves to ensure that their notes could be converted into gold as, as was required by their charters okay when their reserves declined because of a balance of payments deficit or adverse domestic circumstances they would raise their discount rates the interest rates at which they would lend money to other banks doing so would raise interest rates more generally which in turn affected foreign investment thereby bringing more gold into the country okay Central banks adhere to the gold standards rule of maintaining gold convertibility above all other considerations. Gold convertibility serves as the economy's nominal anchor, that is, the amount of money banks could supply was constrained by the value of the gold they held in reserve, and this in turn determined the prevailing price level, and because the price level was tied to a known commodity, this long-run value was determined by market forces. Expectations about the future price level were tied to it as well. Okay, let's explain this first. The gold standard, basically, um, legal tender. We have paper money, bills, and coins. The total amount that would be in circulation in the whole country, in the whole economy, Philippine economy, as well as uh, those in reserves in the BSP, yung uh, still on hand at the BSP, the total value of that would have to be backed by gold reserves as in, you know, the literal gold, okay? And then the gold is essentially a commodity that's, um, what do you call this? It's recognized to have value and um, it it's it's value does fluctuate it goes up it goes down but essentially it's what backs the uh, printed money or the minted coins that are in circulation okay earlier um, we've mentioned that the BSP can only print money uh, needed by the economy but another constraint is that it could only print um, money up to the value of the gold reserves that they have okay so if you know they cannot essentially print more than what is uh by because essentially the gold in reserves are what backs the uh, currency that we have either in circulation or in their reserves okay so that's uh another role that they are playing so in a sense early central banks were strongly committed to price stability they did not worry too much about one of the modern goals of central banking the stability of the real economy because they were constrained by their obligation to adhere to the gold standard okay central banks of this era also learned to act as lenders of last resort in times of financial stress when events like bad harvest the by railroads or wars 
precipitated a scramble for liquidity in which depositors run to their banks and try to convert their deposits into cash. Okay. The lesson began early in the 19th century as a consequence of the Bank of England's routine response to such panics. At that time, uh, the bank and other Euro European central banks would often protect their own gold reserves first, turning away their correspondents in need. Doing so precipitated major panics in 1825, 1837, 1847, and 1857, very often, and led to severe criticism of the bank. In response, the bank adopted the responsibility doctrine proposed by the economic uh, writer Walter Bach. What's this? Bejot, which uh, required the bank to subsume its private interest to the public interest of the banking system as a whole. The bank began to follow Bejot's rule, which was to lend freely on the basis of any sound collateral offered, but at a penalty rate that is above market rates to prevent moral hazard. The bank learned its lesson well, no financial crisis occurred in England. For nearly 150, 150 years after 1866, it wasn't until August 2007 that the country experienced its next crisis. You see, the financial crisis of 2008. Basically, it started in 20, 2007, persisted until 2008. Okay. So, uh, in this part, so the banks also, what do you call this? They accepted collaterals you know, before they could lend to uh, the borrowers. Uh, they started requiring collaterals. The U.S. experience was most interesting. It had two central banks in the early 19th century: the Bank of the United States, 1791 to 1811, and the Second Bank of the United States from 1816 to 1836. Both were set up on the model of the Bank of England. But unlike the British, Americans bore a deep-seated distrust of any concentration of financial power in general and of central banks in particular, so that in each case, the, the charters were not renewed. Okay? From what I know, um, Americans, they prefer cash okay, over cars, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I couldn't be sure. Okay? But basically, during this time period, that's what happened because you know the Americans, they 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 did not like uh, putting their money in the bank. So a lot of them uh, keep their money in their own houses. They have their own safes inside their houses. I've been watching uh, true crime videos, documentaries, and a lot of the crimes that occurred, which involved stealing, uh, there are a lot of money. Uh, stolen from houses because those people did not put their money in in the banks they kept them in their homes okay and those true crime stories that I've seen are you know, is in, the, in the year 2000 already okay so I think even now there are still a number of uh, Americans who prefer to keep their money in their houses and then putting them in banks Anyway, uh, there followed an 80-year period characterized by considerable financial instability. Between 1836 and the onset of the Civil War, a period known as the Free Banking Era, states allowed virtual free entry into banking with minimal regulation. Throughout the period, banks failed frequently. Yeah, minimal regulation, because and several banking panics occurred. The payment system was notoriously inefficient with thousands of the similar looking state banknotes and counterfeits in circulation. So I guess they do have reasons for not putting their money in the banks. In response, the government created the national banking system. Oh, finally, during the Civil War. Well, the system improved the efficiency of the payment system by providing a uniform currency Based on national banknotes, it still provided no lender of last resort. Oh, that's bad. And the euro was rife with severe banking panic. So without this, the lender of last resort, then you can really not, oh, what do you call this? You would not be assured putting your money in a bank that might 
probably fail and go bankrupt, then your money would just be gone. Okay? There's no one to help out. So, yeah, I'm not going to put my money in a bank if the case is like this. The crisis of 1907 was the straw that broke the camel's back. It led to the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, which was given the mandate of providing a uniform and elastic currency. That is, one which would accommodate the seasonal, cyclical, and secular, secular movements in the economy, and to serve as a lender of last resort, finally. Okay, so next, we have the genesis of modern central banking goals. Before 1914, central banks didn't attach great weight to the goal of maintaining the domestic economy's stability. This changed after World War I, when they began to be concerned about employment, relativity, and the price level. Okay, so basically these are the current responsibilities of central bank. Okay? Ensuring high employment rate, and then circulation of money, and then price stability. The shift reflected a change in the political economy of many countries. Suffrage was expanding, labor movements were rising, and restrictions on migration were being set. In the 1920s, the Fed, Federal Reserve, began focusing on both external stability, which meant keeping an eye on gold reserves because the U.S. was still on the gold standard, and the internal stability which meant keeping an eye on prices, output, and employment. But as long as the gold standard prevailed, external goals dominated. Okay. Unfortunately, the, the Fed's monetary policy led to serious problems in the 1920s and 1930s. Why? When it came to managing the nation's quantity of money, the Fed followed the principle called the Real Bills Doctrine. The doctrine argued that the quantity of money needed in the economy would naturally be supplied so long as reserve banks lent funds only when banks presented eligible self-liquidating commercial paper for collateral. Wait, what? Eligible self-liquidating commercial paper. One corollary, sorry, one corollary of the real deal doctrine was that the Fed should not permit bank lending to finance stock market speculation, of course not, which explains why it followed a tight policy in 1928 to upset the Wall Street boom. Oh, okay. They started early with stock trading, okay. stock exchange. The policy led to the beginning of a recession in August 1929 and the crash in October. Then, in the face of a series of banking panics between 1930 and 1933, the Fed failed to act as a lender of last resort, that's too bad. As a result, the money supply collapsed and massive deflation and depression followed. The Fed erred because the real bills doctrine led it to interpret the prevailing low short-term nominal interest rates as a sign of monetary ease and they believed no banks needed funds because very few member banks came to the discount window. Okay. So essentially, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, the concept, before the concept of central banks reached the other countries, they definitely heard already the failures that happened, uh, you know, in the Fed. And of course, they would have already uh, thought of solutions, okay, that could address the problems that occurred and how they could, you know, um, prevent or how they could avoid them you know in case they implement the same central bank system in their own countries <clears throat> okay after the great depression the federal reserve system was reorganized the banking acts of 1933 and 1935 shifted power definitively from the reserve banks to the board of governors in addition the fed was made subservient to the treasury the Fed regained its independence from the Treasury in 1951, wherein, whereupon it began following a deliberate counter-cyclical policy under the di directorship of William Assist. Like Chesney Martin, during the 1950s, this policy was quite su successful in ameliorating several recessions and in maintaining low inflation. Okay, very good, they already le learned their lesson. At the time, the United States and the other advanced countries were part of the Bretton Woods system under which the U.S. pegged the dollar 
to gold at $35 per ounce and the other countries pegged to the dollar. So the start of exchange rates. The link to gold may have carried over some of the credibility of a nominal anchor and helped to keep inflation low. Okay. So that's why in a way, uh, gold standards are being used as basis by some central banks okay, in the amount of money that they can supply to the economy. The picture changed dramatically in the 1960s when the Fed began following a more activist uh, stabilization policy. In this decade, it shifted its priorities from low inflation toward high employment. Okay. Why the shift? Why can't you focus on both? Possible reasons include the adoption of Keynesian ideas and the belief in the Phillips curve trade-off trade between inflation and unemployment. Mm -hmm. right. The consequence of the shift in policy was the build-up of inflationary pressures from the late 1960s until the end of the 1970s. The causes of the Great Inflation are still being debated, but the era is renowned as one of the low points in Fed history. I mean, you did the shift from low inflation to high employment, so, you know, currently these two are, you know, being balanced. Both are being given focus by central banks. You have to maintain low inflation while also trying to achieve high employment. Okay? You can't just ignore one and focus on another. So they had problems, you know, when they focus on uh, high employment and they do away with the low inflation. So they had problems again. The restraining influence of the nominal anchor disappeared and for the next two decades, inflation expectations took off. The inflation ended with fall, Paul Volcker's shock therapy from 1979 to 1982, which involved monetary tightening and the raising of policy interest rates to double digits. The Volcker shock led to a sharp recession, but it was successful in breaking the back of high inflation expectations. In the following decades, inflation declined significantly, good, and has stayed low ever since. All right. Since the early 1990s, the Fed has followed a policy of implicit inflation targeting, using the federal funds rate as its policy instrument. In many respects, the policy regime currently followed echoes the convertibility principle of the gold standard in the sense that the public has come to believe in the credibility of the Fed's commitment to low inflation. A key force in the history of central banking has been central bank independence. The original central banks were private and independent. They depended on the government to maintain their charters but were otherwise free to, cho to choose their own tools and policies. Very good. Their goals were constrained by gold convertibility in the 20th century. Most of these central banks were nationalized and completely lost their independence. Well, the majority of the central banks are under the government already currently okay uh-huh where are we their goals were constrained by gold i'm oh, sorry their policies were dictated by the fiscal authorities government the fed regained its its independence after 1951 but its independence is not absolute it must report to the congress which ultimately has the power to change the Federal Reserve Act. Other central banks had to wait until the 1990s to regain their independence. Then we have financial stability. Um, an increasing important role for central banks is financial stability, of course. The evolution of this responsibility has been similar across advanced countries. In the gold standard era, central banks developed a lender of last resort function following Bishop's rule. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. <laughs> Alright, uh, but financial systems became unstable between the world wars as widespread banking crisis plagued the early 1920s and the 1930s. The experience of the Fed was the worst. The response to banking crisis in Europe at the time was generally to bail out the troubled banks with public funds. Not good. But since the central banks are now part of the government, then go ahead. This approach was later adopted by the United States with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, but on a limited scale. After the Depression, every country established a financial safety net 
comprising deposit insurance and heavy regulation that included interest rate ceilings and firewalls between financial and commercial institutions. As a result, there were no banking crises from the late 1930s until the mid-1970s anywhere in the advanced world. This changed dramatically in the 1970s, the Great Inflation. Uh, this happened, uh, we've seen earlier, with the Fed. Uh, this undermined interest rate ceilings and inspired financial innovations designed to circumvent the ceilings and other restrictions. Uh, basically, I think this, they are not that strictly regulated yet because, you know, they've been able to circumvent. These innovations led to deregulation and increased competition. Banking instability reemerged in the United States and abroad, with such examples of large-scale financial disturbances and as the failures of Franklin National in 1974 and Continental Illinois in 1984 and the savings and loan crisis in the 80, 1980s. The reaction to these disturbances was to bail out banks considered too big to fail, a reaction which likely increased the possibility of moral hazard. Many of these issues were resolved by the Depository Institutions to Regulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980 and the Basel I Accords which emphasized the holding of bank capital as a way to encourage prudent behavior. Okay. Basel I Accords, it basically this is the start of uh, requiring banks to maintain a, a certain percentage of the capital and not to use it in the operations or in uh, lending to other customers. Okay? They have to maintain a certain level of capital. Okay? And then of course, uh, this emphasizes the importance of regulating banks because if you allow them to, you know, to do what they want, if you deregulate them, then, you know, uh, history provides that they're bound to fail at some point, okay? And then there's the other issue, uh, bailing banks that are considered too big to fail. Basically, it's, you know, a blender of last resort, but if you're only going to do that for banks that are too big to fail, uh, basically, it's, it's, it's going to be discouraging for other types of banks and to the public as well because essentially you're helping a sinking ship. Okay, that's not a good, <laughs> that's not a good comparison, but it's, it's something like that. But it's like you're encouraging uh, the banks to fail in a way because they have this thought that even if we fail, the central bank is going to help us, okay? So that's uh, that's basically the concept that comes out of it, which is not a good one, okay? Another problem that has re-emerged in modern times is that of asset booms and busts. Stock market and housing booms are often associated with the business cycle boom boom phase and bust often trigger economic downturns. Uh, orthodox central bank policy is to not diffuse booms before they turn to bust for fear of triggering a recession, but to react after the bust occurs and to supply ample liquidity to pr protect the payments and banking systems. This was the policy followed by Alan Greenspan after the stock market crash of 1987. Uh, basically, we only had PSE in 2002 okay so we do not have any experience with uh their market crash okay in a, in a way it's good because by the time we established our philippine stock exchange we already have this uh history lessons to ensure that they're not going to have it okay uh, ideally the policies should remove excess liquidity once the threat of crisis has passed Okay, I think this is the last part, hopefully. Challenges for the future. The key challenge I see facing central banks in the future will be to balance their three policy goals. Yes. Primary goal is price stability, okay, low inflation. Uh -huh. This goal requires credit credibility to work. In other words, people need to believe that the central bank will tighten its policy if inflation threatens. So far, uh, Banco Central and Philippines has been doing well. 
And then, uh, this belief needs to be backed by actions, such was the case in the mid-1990s when the Fed tightened in response to an inflation scare. Such a strategy can be greatly enhanced by good communication. Yes. And of course, if you Google uh, inflation rate Philippines, the information is actually publicly available. Okay. The second policy goal uh, is stability and growth of the real economy, you know, um, GDP, public spending, uh, without triggering inflation, of course. And considerable evidence suggests that low inflation is associated with better growth and overall macro macroeconomic performance. Nevertheless, big shocks still occur, threatening to derail the economy from its goal growth path. When such situations threaten, research also suggests that the central bank should temporarily depart from its long-run inflation goal and ease monetary policy to offset recessionary forces. Moreover, if market agents believe in the long-run credibility of the central bank's commitment to low inflation, the cut in policy interest rates will not engender high inflation expectations. Okay. Once the recession is avoided or has played its course, the central bank needs to raise rates and return to its low inflation goal. Okay, that's good. Third policy is financial stability. Research has shown that it also will be improved in an environment of low inflation, although some economists argue that asset price booms are spawned in such an environment. In the case of an incipient uh, financial crisis, such as uh, the one that occurred in 2007-2008, the current view is that the curse of policy should be to provide whatever liquidity is required to allay the fears of the money market. An open discount window and acceptance of whatever sound collateral is offered are seen as the correct prescription. Yes, collateral, of course. Moreover, funds should be offered at a penalty rate. Interest. Uh, the Fed followed these rules in 2007, although it is unclear whether the funds were provided at a penalty rate. Once the crisis is over, which generally is in a matter of days or weeks, the central bank must remove the excess liquidity and return to its inflation objective. The Federal Reserve followed this strategy after Y2K when no financial crisis occurred. It promptly withdrew the massive infusion of liquidity it had provided. By contrast, after providing funds following the attacks of 9-11 and the technology bust of 2001, it permitted additional funds to remain in the money market. Once the threat of crisis was over, if the markets had not been infused with so much liquidity for so long, interest rates would, have, would not have been as low in recent years as they had been. And the housing boom might not have uh, as expanded as much as it did. Okay. A second challenge is to keep abreast of financial innovations, which can derail financial stability. Uh, financial innovations, I think, in recent years would be, you know, uh, getting the services of banks online. Okay. Innovations in the financial markets are a challenge to deal with as they represent attempts to circumvent regulation as well as to reduce transaction costs and enhance leverage. Um, when the banks started offering their services online, of course, there are challenges, there are problems, there are scams, you know, phishing scams or hacking, that kind of thing, okay? So the recent subprime crisis exemplifies the danger. Many problems were caused by derivatives created to package mortgages of dubious quality with sounder ones so the instruments could be unloaded off the balance sheets of commercial and investment funds. This strategy designed to dissipate risk may have backfired because of the opacity of the new instruments. Too risky. Okay. A third challenge, uh, whether to adopt an explicit inflation targeting objective like the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, and other central banks. Uh, basically, the BSP, Bank of Central and Philippines, they do set uh, inflation targeting. Okay, They wanted to ensure that for a particular year, they're not going to breach uh, the inflation rate that they set the target. Okay. Of course, uh, as much as possible, they want it to be below that rate, but the projection is it should be up to that point only. Okay, they couldn't, it's not that they couldn't go over that, but it would be bad if the economy actually go beyond the inflation rate that they've set. 
are projected. Okay. However, it might be difficult to combine an explicit target with the Fed's dual mandate of price stability and high employment. The fourth challenge, globalization and other supply-side developments, such as political instability and oil price and other stocks. Outside our control, understandable. Final challenge, uh, whether implicit or explicit inflation targeting should be replaced with price level targeting. Uh, I think inflation targeting would be easier to monitor than price level targeting, okay? Research has shown that the price level may be the superior target because it avoids the problem of base drift and it also has less long-run price uncertainty. The disadvantage is that recessionary shocks might cause a deflation where the price level declines. This possibility should not be a problem if the nominal anchor is credible because the public would realize that inflationary and deflationary episodes are transitory and prices will, will always revert to their mean, that is, towards the daily rate. I mean, it's... I mean, price level is dictated by supply and demand okay so there is that such a strategy is not likely to be adopted in the near future because central banks are concerned that deflation might get out of control or be associated with recession on account of nominal rigid rigidness what rigidities okay in addition the transition would involve reducing inflation expectations from the present plateau of about 2%, which would likely involve deliberately engineering a recession, a policy not likely to ever be popular. Yes, it won't be. Okay, so we've only finished the first part and I'm already tired a bit. I'm going to continue. Should I continue tomorrow? I'm just going to finish this today. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Brief history of Banco Central. I got this from the BSP website. Okay. So, a group of Filipinos has, had conceptualized Central Bank for the Philippines as early as 1933. So, it came up with the rudiments of a bill for the establishment of Central Bank for the country after a careful study of the economic provisions of the what's this, hair horse cutting bill. The Philippine Independence Bill approved by the U.S. Congress. During the Commonwealth period, the discussion about the Philippine Central Bank that would promote price stability and economic growth continued. The country's monetary system then was administered by the Department of Finance and the National Treasury. The Philippines was on the exchange standard using the U.S. dollar, which was backed by 100% gold reserve as the standard currency. Okay. In 1939, as required by the Tidings McDuffie Act, the Philippine legislature passed a law establishing a central bank. As it was a monetary law, it required approval of the United States President. I, I think during this time, are we under the U.S. rule? However, Pre President Franklin D. Roosevelt disapproved it due to strong opposition from vested interest. A second law was passed in 1944 during the Japanese occupation. But the arrival of the American liberalization forces aborted its implementation. Okay. Shortly after President Manuel Rojas assumed office in 1946, he instructed uh, the finance secretary to draw up a charter for a central bank. And then the establishment of the monetary authority became imperative a year later as a result of the findings of the Joint Philippine American Finance Commission chaired by Mr. Quaderno. The commission, which studied Philippine financial, monetary, and fiscal problems in 1947, recommended a shift from the dollar exchange standard to a managed currency system. The central bank was necessary to implement the proposed shift to this new system. Okay. At this point, we already had our very own currency. Okay. Uh -huh. It was submitted to the Congress in February 1948. By June, the newly proclaimed President Carino uh, succeeded Rojas, affixed his signature on RA 265, the Central Act of 1948. And then the Central Bank of the Philippines was established, a step toward national sovereignty. Over the years, changes were introduced to make the charter more responsive to the needs of the economy. 
1972, PD72 adopted the recommendations of the Joint IMF CB Banking Survey Commission, IMF International Monetary Fund. They are already existing back then, which made a study of the Philippine banking system. The Commission proposed a program designed to ensure the system soundness and healthy growth. Its most important recommendations were related to the objectives of the central bank, its policy making structures, scope of authority, and the procedures for uh, dealing with problem uh, financial institutions. Subsequent changes sought to enhance the capability of the central bank in the light of the developing economy to enforce banking laws and regulations and to respond to emerging, uh, emerging central banking issues. So, 1973 Constitution, the National Assembly uh, mandated to establish an independent central monetary authority. Later, PD 1801 designated the central bank as the central monetary authority. Okay. Years later, the Constitution adopted the provisions on the CMA, uh, essentially establishing an independent monetary authority through increased capitalization and greater private sector representation in the monetary board. The administration that followed the transition, Person Aquino, uh, saw the turning of another chapter in the Philippine Central Banking. Uh, President Rama signed into the law a uh, new Central Bank Act. The law provides for the establishment of an independent monetary authority to be known as the Banco Central of the Philippines, okay, from the English Central Bank of the Philippines, again, as well, Banco Central of the Philippines. With the maintenance of price stability explicitly stated as, as its primary objective, uh, this objective was only implied in the old one. Okay, so that's it. Alright, so that was the last part in the history of BSP. Okay, it was at this point that it was already called Banco Central in the Philippines. And then we have the objectives of BSP. So we have the vision. I simply included this. Again, these are from the BSP website. The BSP aims to be recognized globally as the monetary authority and primary financial system supervisor that supports a strong economy and promotes a high quality of life for all Filipinos. Mission to promote and maintain price stability, strong financial system, and a safe and efficient payments and settlement system conducive to a sustainable and inclusive growth of the economy. Okay, primary objective price stability, conducive to a balanced and sustainable growth of the economy and employment. Again, this was implicit in the, uh, what do you call this? Uh, the latest Central Bank Act. New Central Bank Act. Okay. The Bank of Central shall promote financial stability, closely work with national government, uh, including but not limited to the Department of Finance, Securities and Exchange Commission, the Insurance Commission, and the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation. Banco Central shall oversee the payment and settlement systems in the Philippines, including critical financial market infrastructures, in order to promote sound and prudent practices consistent with the maintenance of financial stability. In the attainment of its objectives, BSP shall promote broad and convenient access to high-quality financial services, and consider the interests of the general public. Okay. And then lastly, we have the functions of Central Bank. This is from lawfield.net. Our responsibilities provides direction in the areas of money, banking, and credit, supervises operations of banks, exercises regulatory powers over non bank financial institutions with quasi banking functions. So basically, BSP monitors bank and non bank financial institutions. So the functions uh, under the new Central Bank Act of 1993, the BSP performs the following functions. Liquidity management. BSP formulates and implements monetary policy aimed at influencing money supply consistency with its primary objective to maintain price stability. Okay. So they do control the amount of money in circulation. Okay. They either increase that or decrease that uh, depending on the economic situation. Currency issue, the BSP has the exclusive power to issue the national currency, printing of uh, banknotes, and minting of coins. Okay. 
fully guaranteed by the government and are considered legal tender for all private and public debts. Lender of last resort. The BSP extends discounts, loans, and advances to banking institutions for liquidity purposes. Financial supervision supervises banks and exercises regulatory uh, powers over non-bank institutions performing quasi-banking functions. Management of foreign currency reserves, uh, they seek to maintain sufficient international reserves to meet any foreseeable net demands for foreign currencies in order to preserve the international stability and convertibility of the Philippine peso because of international trade, uh, foreign exchange. Determination of the exchange rate policy, so they determine the daily. The BSP adheres to market-oriented foreign exchange rate policy such that the role of BSP is principally to ensure orderly conditions in the market. And then lastly, other activities. BSP functions as a banker, financial advisor, and official depository of the government. Its political subdivisions and instrumentalities and GOCCs, government-owned and controlled corporations. Okay, so that's it for topic number two. Yes, we're done already. So that's it for module one. We have topic one and topic number two. So this is it for this video. We're done. Thanks and bye.